The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde was written by Robert Louis Stevenson and came out in 1886. And it has lasted as one of the most frightening stories known to humankind. A lot of people know the twist in this story, but they don't know much about the story otherwise. And it's a shame, because it really is an interesting story. It's a story about science, it's a story about human beings and what they're capable of, but most of all, it's a story about secrets. Is it possible for evil and good to coexist within somebody? Or is it possible for a human to be completely good or completely evil? That's the question that the book tries to answer. And it opens, symbolically, with a door. Robert Louis Stevenson invites you to begin the story by starting with the story of the door and two characters, Mr Enfield and Mr Utterson, who are having a walk through London. And it's important to remember that the London in this story isn't the illustrious, beautiful city that Oliver Twist thinks it is. It's a dark labyrinth. It's lit by dim gaslight. And around every corner, there's something waiting to surprise you. The story of the door introduces us to Mr. Utterson, the rather uninteresting lawyer who is soon to be entangled in the mystery of Mr. Hyde. He is cold, quiet, and subjected to a story by Mr. Enfield of a young child who was trampled by the enigmatic and off-putting Edward Hyde, who brings suspicion upon himself when he pays off the child's family with money belonging to the well-loved Dr. Henry Jekyll. The next thing was to get the money. And where do you think he carried us? but to that place with the door, whipped out a key, went in, and presently came back with the matter of ten pounds in gold and a check for the balance on coots, drawn payable to bearer, and signed with a name that I can't mention, though it's one of the points of my story. Blackmail house is what I call that place with the door in consequence. Though even that, you know, is far from explaining all, he added, and with the words fell into a vein of musing. And you never asked about the place with the door, said Mr. Utterson. But don't just get caught up in the horrific drama of Mr. Hyde and how awful he is. Really, there is a central question to this book, a question about duality, and as we said at the start, secrets. Secrets that we don't just keep from other people, but we keep from ourselves. Is there an evil side to you that you don't want to consider? Is it possible to get rid of that side? Is it possible to want to get rid of it? Would we really want to get rid of the darkness within us and be left with just the good? What kind of person would that be? Such a person might go insane. One October late in the 1800s, London witnessed a crime so shocking it sparked a citywide manhunt for the perpetrator. The sole witness, a maid, reported that she had been looking out upon the moonlit city from the upper floor of a house when she saw two men meet under a street lamp below. According to the maid, one man was obviously smaller than the other and they both briefly spoke before the shorter man began beating the other. The fight ended with the smaller man jumping so much upon the other that the maid heard bones breaking and by the end of it, one man was dead and the other had escaped. This crime never happened, but it is the focus of the fourth chapter of the story, the Keru murder case, which comes fittingly after the relatively calm-sounding Dr. Jekyll was quite at ease. It is interesting to notice that even the tone of the book seems to flip unexpectedly, which reflects the changes Dr. Jekyll experiences. The crime, described as ferocious, features one of the few female characters in the book, and takes place in the classic gothic setting where moonlight and fog roam. 
Hyde is once again animalistic, trampling and shattering bones. It's the goriest scene in the story and cements Hyde as pure evil. Nearly a year later, in the month of October 18, London was startled by a crime of singular ferocity and rendered all the more notable by the high position of the victim. The details were few and startling. A maidservant living alone in a house not far from the river had gone upstairs to bed about eleven. Although a fog rolled over the city in the small hours, the early part of the night was cloudless, and the lane which the maid's window overlooked was brilliantly lit by the full moon. And as she so sat, she became aware of an aged and beautiful gentleman with white hair, drawing near along the lane, and advancing to meet him, another and very small gentleman, to whom at first she paid less attention. Now the content of the story might not shock us modern readers, but the society in which it came out, in a deeply religious Victorian society, uh, it was shocking. And it raised some questions that made a lot of people uncomfortable. For some, it just confirmed what they already knew, that every human being is capable of good and evil. Everyone has a dark side and a good side, maybe constantly fighting against one another. But for others, it was very disturbing to think about that, to think that within us all there's not only evil, but an animal. We hear of Hyde's ape-like fury. He's described as something inhuman, something animalistic multiple times throughout the book. And this being in a time where everyone believed and everyone thought that humans were divinely created. There's no way that they could be related to animals. That was a really deeply frightening question to confront in your mind. And at that, Mr. Hyde broke out of all bounds and clubbed him to the earth. And next moment, with ape-like fury, he was trampling his victim underfoot and hailing down a storm of blows under which the bones were audibly shattered and the body jumped upon the roadway. At the horror of these sights and sounds, the maid fainted. Now that's not to say that human beings aren't special, but Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species had come out 27 years earlier and put forth the theory of evolution by natural selection, and it really was a bit disturbing to consider for some people that we were related to apes and we had a common ancestor. But it wasn't just that thought which put people off and made them feel a bit uneasy about the story. Just like a creepy painting, the closer you look, the more strange details come out. And again, we might not find some of the content of this story very frightening now, but there are some bizarre things to note. For example, there aren't many female characters in the story at all. There are only really about two, and they don't really have much to do in the story. And all of the male characters are bachelors. They like to have parties and they like to drink. And it's a bit strange. These are people who aren't married. They don't talk about their partners. In fact, the story starts with two men, Mr. Utterson and Mr. Enfield, walking around London like they do every Sunday. And they like to walk without talking. And it's the best part of the week for them. These are characters and situations and circumstances that, for a lot of the readers at the time, would have been realistic, but something they wouldn't want to have considered. You know the doctor's ways, sir, replied Poole, and how he shuts himself up? Well, he's shut up again in the cabinet, and I don't like it. Sir, I wish I may die if I like it. Mr. Utterson, sir, I'm afraid. I've been afraid for about a week, and I can bear it no more. The man's appearance amply bore out his words. His manner was altered for the worse and except for the moment when he had first announced his terror, he had not once looked the lawyer in the face. I can bear it no more, he repeated. Now, it's a common misconception that the Jack the Ripper murders inspired Robert Louis Stevenson with this book. Um, actually, the Jack the Ripper murders happened a few years after the book came out, and there is a bit of an urban legend that may be true, actually, about a uh, theater production of the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, where the actor playing Henry Jekyll was so convincing that one of the audience members reported him to the police, thinking that he must be the murderer, because he portrayed this man who could flip so easily into evil so well. Now, the idea of human beings being able to do good and bad things isn't anything new to literature. William Shakespeare's play Macbeth, set in medieval Scotland, focuses on Macbeth 
who is convinced by three witches and their prophecies to kill the king so that he may become the king. Maybe. Is he really forced by supernatural forces to kill the king and do these horrible things? Or is it that this evil motive was in him already and he was just convinced to do it? Maybe he was given permission. In other words, was he always evil or was he made evil by the people around him? Is he really responsible for his actions? But Jekyll and Hyde is different. The strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Hyde poses a question to you. It says that this evil is in you, and this good is also in you. Do you have control over it? It is in the final chapter that we really get to know Henry Jekyll. We hear his voice, and we read his words. And we come to realise that we are just like him, with his interests, worries and passions. And we ask ourselves, can we really blame him, or judge him for what he wanted? We also realise that we are all like Dr Jekyll, and really, we are all like Mr Hyde. But is that so bad? <laughs>